The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Hey folks, today is Tuesday. Uh, today again, today is uh, Tuesday. Glad to be with you, January 31st, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, live from Richmond, Virginia. Police report uh, obtained by the New York Times of the officers in Memphis. Uh, it shows you exactly what they put on their report, which is contradicted by the body cam footage. We'll tell you exactly what was in that report. Uh, and again, show you how the cops lied uh, on that report, the NAACP would join us as well. Uh, also, the investigation continues into the death of Tyree Nichols. There was a news conference today in Memphis. People still want answers in his death. Uh, also, uh, on uh, today's show, on Capitol Hill, uh, debate police reform. Senator Tim Scott is claiming Democrat Dick Durbin is blocking his police bill. But this is the same Tim Scott who blocked the George Floyd Justice Act. Uh, also, folks, uh, the ruling in a, in a uh, Confederate monument in Tuskegee will tell you about that, how the uh, dogs of the Confederacy, they have lost there. That and more on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. It's time to bring the funk. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop of All right, folks, Roland Martin here broadcasting live from Richmond, Virginia. Um, so much attention remains uh, on Memphis, Tennessee, uh, regarding the death of Tyree Nichols. Today, the New York Times reported the actual police report that was filed by the cops. We're going to detail that uh, after our next break. But it goes to show you that the cops, can how they lie on police reports, and they are contradicted by, by what happens in the body camera footage. Now, the family of Tyree Nichols, they are preparing for his funeral. That will be taking place uh, there in Memphis. Vice President Kamala Harris is going to be attending his funeral as well. Uh, activists and others in Memphis continue to demand answers from the Memphis Police Department, not just in the case of Tyree Nichols, but in other examples of police violence as well. And so even though Memphis has moved ex expeditiously in terms of firing these officers, you've had three uh, fire officials uh, who were also uh, fired as well. Folks still want answers because they say they have not gotten enough answers out of Memphis PD and the City Hall as it relates to Tyree Nichols and this Scorpion unit. And so we continue to focus on this. Uh, and there's more that is being uncovered as each day progresses. Uh, also, uh, folks are also asking uh, FedEx, uh, where Tyree Nichols worked, 
How, why, why aren't they doing more as well? Yes, they released a statement on Friday with regards to his death, but why aren't they pushing uh, city officials and demanding more accountability? We'll talk about that as well, how the business community can really do their part to step up and hold police departments and cities accountable as well. And so, uh, so much to unpack uh, when it comes to what's going on in Memphis. Uh, the Memphis NAACP is going to be joining us after the break. We've got our panel as well. And so we've got a number of folks still breaking down what is happening with regards to the death of Tyree Nichols. And so, so much to uncover and to unpack as well. I'm going to take a quick, short break. We come back, we'll continue the conversation, we'll tell you what the New York Times reported in that police uh, file as well. Folks, don't forget to follow us in what we do. If you want to make sure to see uh, our content where we're not being uh, shadow banned by these uh, digital platforms, download our Black Star Network app. It's available on Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, you can also assist us in our efforts uh, when you join our Brina Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. And so uh, please do so by, by sending your check and money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. I'll be right back. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're going to have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really got to know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. You are watching Roland Martin, and I'm on his show today. And it's what, huh? We should have some cue cards. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E.
Welcome back, Roller Mark Unfiltered. Joining me right now is Van Turner. He is the uh, he's an attorney, state legal redress chair, uh, and the president of the Memphis branch of the NAACP. My panel: Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for environmental justice at EPA, EPA; Randy Bryant, diversity and inclusion strategist, speaker, trainer, and writer; Michael Brown, former chair of DNC Finance Committee. Uh, Van, I, I want to start with you. Uh, the New York Times. Uh, first of all, the city of Memphis. Uh, they, of course, uh, have uh, been been you know pushing it as if they are completely on top of this, uh, but the reality is uh, there are some issues here. There's some issues that are still here. Uh, and the New York Times they have discovered, uh, or, or they've gotten their hands on the police report, and it shows you what happens when cops say one thing and do another. There was a news conference being held today. Folks are still demanding answers. Uh, what is the Memphis NAACP? What are you demanding of this police department as well as this uh, city council? regarding the death of Tyree Nichols? We're demanding action and continued action. I think we're up to seven officers now, Roland. And so we started out with the five police officers, which we all saw. They were spread out across the media. They were terminated. They were indicted. But after that, uh, Hemp, Officer Hemp Hill pops in, and he's a white officer. And then we have a seventh officer, and we've yet to... Uh, learn the identity of that particular officer. We've had three emergency medical technician officers who have been uh, terminated and relieved mm -hmm. duty, two sheriff deputies. So this is an ongoing investigation. We demand continued transparency and action. All involved should be terminated and brought to justice. Uh, and again, uh, the New York Times is reporting based upon the police report that they filed, they were trying to cover up uh, this violent offense. These uh, six disgraced officers, what they did was they said he was pulled over for reckless driving at a high speed, saying that Nichols was irate and sweating profusely when he got out of his vehicle and resisted arrest. The report mentions the use of pepper spray and the taser had no effect on Nichols, that he became violent. They also stated that uh, uh, Nichols started to fight with officers and at one point grabbed the gun of one of the detectives claiming Emmett Martin III, who assaulted Nichols, was the victim in the report. Well, we all know that's a flat out lie. And this again, right. this is what this is what happens when these cops lie on police reports. And thank goodness we have video that contradicts what they said. Otherwise, their account is what people will go with. That's absolutely right. Uh, and essentially what we have here is a fabrication which is taking place, a cover-up. And fortunately, because of the video footage, we were able to, un to have the true facts be revealed and for these officers to be brought to justice. Had we just relied on the officer's report, these officers would still be walking the streets. Had we not had that video, they still would have been allowed to continue to do what they been doing and what they've done and what they did to Tyree Nichols. So uh, we have to have better procedures in place, better oversight. This unit has been disbanded. And so we have to plot out a path going forward. But as you can see, the status quo has not worked. What we've done has not been uh, what the community deserves or wants. The death of Tyree Nichols could have been prevented if we passed the George Floyd Reform Act. And what the family is asking for now is a is a bill out of our Tennessee legislature in name of Tyree Nichols, in the name of Tyree Nichols, which would make it mandatory to intervene, to render aid, and to do all those things that these officers did not do on the night that they killed and murdered Tyree Nichols. Uh, obviously, the city council is going to have to do more and so what do you want to see from city officials? Uh, and are you satisfied uh, with what you heard from the mayor? Because our understanding, she created this union after she came from Atlanta, where they had similar problems with a similar unit. Right. So that's absolutely right. I think it was called the Red Dog Squad in Atlanta. And so I'm satisfied where we are right now because there's been no 
attempt to cover this up, and there's been no, uh, on behalf of Chief Davis, not the officers, and there's been no attempt to suspend officers, and we'll wait and see how the investigation goes. She asked for an immediate termination. The DA put forth an immediate indictment up to murder two. And so those are to be uh, things going forward that every police precinct should do. I think even Attorney Crump said so. But there's still a lot more to take place, a lot more to do. And so we need to see how this goes forward and if the transparency continues and if the openness continues. We are watching. We are demanding that city council act. We're demanding more of our legislators. And quite frankly, we're demanding more of ourselves. We shouldn't just be on the sideline. We should be demanding justice. We should be raising hell because Tyree Nichols died on our watch. We shouldn't have to be here another six months from now, another year from now, talking about another black or brown individual who has lost their life to law enforcement officers who have gone rogue. This is the time that we have to act, and we call on all our elected officials and stakeholders to join us as we seek justice for Tyree. We fight for the George Floyd Reform Act. We fight for the Tyree Nichols Reform Act. It's simply time is, is up. We got to do it, and we got to do it now. Um, all right, Van Turner, uh, we certainly appreciate you joining us. Uh, thanks a bunch. Keep, keep us abreast uh, of what happens next. Thank you. All right, folks, going to go to a break. We come back. I'll talk to my panel uh, about this. Again, cops continue to lie on police reports. Uh, and as an official document, it happens over and over and over again. And the only way they get busted is the video contradicts them. And so we'll talk to them about that when we come back. Uh, folks, don't forget uh, to vote for Roland Martin on the the Black Star Network for the NAACP Image Award. Uh, we have been nominated. Uh, and so what you can do is go to vote.nwacpimageawards.net. Uh, Look, go to the outstanding news and information uh, category. Look for Roller Martin Unfiltered. You can vote for us. You can only use one email to vote. So if you got several emails, you can vote several times. Uh, so uh, please vote for us and make that happen. And of course, uh, voting ends on February 10th, 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. next a balanced life with me dr jackie a relationship that we have to have we're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it that's right we're talking about our relationship with money and here's the thing our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not the truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge balancing your relationship with your pocketbook that's next on a balanced life with me dr jackie here at black star network What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, let's bring our panel in. Mustafa Santiago Ali, uh, Randy Bryant, uh, Michael Brown. Glad to have all three of you here. Mustafa, I'm going to start with you. I mean, we have talked about this ad nauseum. What happens 
when these officers lie on these police reports. And were it not for the video, frankly, the public uh, and the prosecutors and police departments, they always go with these cops' version of events. I mean, they simply just lie on the report. Yeah, we see it time and time again. You know, the, the, the problems that we have is that there's very little accountability for officers when they do lie on reports uh, or on the facts of what happened in a situation. And you know me, Roland, I, I like facts and I like research. So, you know, back in 2020, Professor Phil Stenson, who was over there at Bowling Green University, is a, a criminologist. He actually tracked the race, uh, arrest cases uh, for a number of years and found out of 10,000 cases that over 6% of those uh, had police officers that were giving false statements and false reports. And 25% of those actually were dealing with police violence. So we find that, you know, these incidents continue to happen and the facts uh, are showing us that they're happening. Now, he also shared uh, in his research that he felt that the numbers were higher, but based upon uh, the time that he had to actually investigate this, that's where it is. So we're talking about a huge amount of cases that are out there that we know police officers are lying. Uh, and, and, and that really uh, what, 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 what jumps out here, uh, Randy. I mean, they will sit here and make up stuff on the police reports. Uh, they will uh, uh, just uh, lie. And, and all too often, they aren't held accountable. And, and I've long said, if they lie on a police report, then they should be automatically fired absolutely be automatically fired. And to build off of what Mustafa just said, there was a study in 2020 that of cases where people were wrongfully convicted, they were, the, ma the major reason that people are wrongfully convicted is due to police misconduct. 35 percent due to police misconduct. And if you look at the prosecutors, it goes up to 54 percent. So what's interesting is that there is an unspoken system of just a, a power being abused to put our black and brown people behind bars unfairly or, of course, to injure them or kill them, as we've just seen. Um, you know, you see all the people that they've recently arrested or, or fired by the police department, and they all worked. We didn't see on the camera where they're having conversations about the cover-up, because the cover-up was already understood. They clearly had seen this play out before, and, and, and that's the scary part. Michael, um, it happens over and over and over. And I don't recall seeing the Fraternal Order Police calling out their own when they lie on police reports. Uh, and, oh, it might be a slap on the wrist. But the only time we really know when they lie is when there's evidence that contradicts it. And so Mustafa laid it out there. The number of times when they likely lie on people is astounding. And there are individuals who go to jail, who are charged, who are convicted, based upon police officers who lie. Absolutely. And, and first, let me say, Roland, you look fabulous in purple. Well, first of <laughs> all, al al alphas can wear any color, and we I'm can show y'all how to look, wear it. I'm just saying you look good in purple. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know, al al alphas can wear any color. Um, I tell you, you know what, Roland, you, you, laid, you laid it out. I mean, everybody says, I, I co-sign with everything everybody said. And it's just so interesting and troubling, frankly, that over the last several years, whether it's body cam footage, whether it's poll footage, whether it's folks with cell phones on the side of the street, it still is not making the difference where it's stopping. It's the, it, it doesn't matter that there's video. It may matter bringing people to justice, which is great. Great for the families, great for the community, great for our country. But, it, but we, it, it's not deterring officers from still doing bad acts because they must feel that there's protection in either qualified immunity or it doesn't really matter. My pension is going to be intact. I, they can't sue me personally. So they feel this level of protection, whether they have a camera on, whether somebody's on the side of the street with a camera and whether there's a pole cam. So the more troubling thing is not just obviously that people are getting beat down, in some cases dying, but the fact that they, officers don't seem to care 
that there's video footage until, frankly, they're in a courtroom and heading off to jail. And, 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 and that, that right there is what is so troubling, uh, Mustafa, uh, and that is the excuses that are offered. And, and, and you, yesterday, uh, uh, DeLacy Davis talked about how there has to be mass transformation. Uh, and I just simply believe the only way we are to confront this, the only way is you've got to get rid of qualified immunity. When they know that their butts are on the line, that's when they're going to stop. And when, and when you start snatching pensions. Yes. Most, most definitely. It is always about the dollars that, unfortunately, are what drive people to do the right thing. You know, uh, you know I, we'll probably talk about this later, but, of course, there are pieces of legislation that have been introduced before to address this. And, and if we don't build real accountability into the system, then we're going to continue to see... Uh, folks doing all kinds of things. If police officers who are standing on the sidelines watching this happen uh, don't feel that there is any accountability for them also, then it's going to, the dehumanization, the brutalization inside of our communities will continue. And so we have an opportunity in this moment, just like we did when George Floyd was killed and a number of other people both killed and brutalized to change this. The question will become if people will continue to put pressure and if we will force our politicians to do the right thing. It's always the money, Randy. And and look, as long as these cops know, hey, we can commit wrongdoing, and 99.9% .9 of the time we can get away with it. And if anything happens, find the city or the other city to pay a settlement. We just keep going. You have to deal with their pensions. And then there are many cases where they get busted, and then if they served a while, oh, I'll retire before I'm actually uh, disciplined by the department. Correct. Or they go to another precinct. What's interesting to me are all the police officers, when they make this big announcement where they were fired, and then we find out that a year later they're working in another town. Um, also, you know, I was thinking, the police department, in my opinion, police, if you look at the history of policing, they're functioning exactly as they were designed. <laughs> so it, we need an entire <laughs> dismantlement of the, the police, of policing because they are functioning as they were designed. Um, I had a conversation with someone, and I said, in all my years in life, I've never called the police, because I've never seen them as a, a solution. I always was a fe fearful that they would make an issue more or worse um, as a black person in America. And I believe that there's probably a lot of people out there that have the same sentiment. You know, um the thing that the other day, Whoopi Goldberg said, uh, maybe the only time that people are going to care in this country is when white people are being brutalized and, oh, the Fox News people just lost their minds, Michael. But it's true. The reality is, in this country, I mean, we're, I remember during the Civil Rights Movement, oh, they'll care about uh, some college kids being killed if they're white, not if they're black. I mean, and so people got mad at Whoopi. She was just stating the truth. <laughs> And that, absolutely. And then the, the, the couple double standards, obviously, that's clearly one. Um, but also, it's interesting, the uh, some of the reaction amongst folks when uh, they heard that the officers were, were black um, or African-American. Obviously, the first gentleman was white who originally pulled him out of his car and tased him and then said, stomp his ass. Um, but it, it shouldn't matter the color of the officers. But what matters is the color of the victims. That always seems to be consistent. And as long as uh, that continues, as you just mentioned, until the demographic change, changes of the victims, uh, it's going to be one of those things. The, um, uh, Mr. Nichols' mom was on one of the news shows, and she had mentioned that a week or two before her son's incident, that there was a, a white young man who spit in a police officer's face. And the police officer politely arrested him and you know, took him downtown to do whatever he was going to do um, about the assault. But she was like, why did my son get that treatment? And so there's, there's seeing, there clearly is a double standard. And you got to assume, whether it was, the, what was it called, the Red Dogs, I think, or the Scorpion Unit, they're not patrolling white neighborhoods. You know, you better believe that. So I'm glad the chief um, disbanded that unit, uh, but there's still obviously, you know, we've, whether it's federal legislation 
local legislation until elected officials have the courage to go up against the police unions in those jurisdictions because no one wants to get up for a re-election and be considered soft on crime and not supporting the police. And the police unions know that. And that's why we're in this dilemma. Uh, and again, um, this is spurring uh, more conversation and hopefully lawmakers to do something uh, when it comes to the issue uh, of police reform. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill, uh, where, you have, where you have Senator Tim Scott whining and complaining, saying Democrat Dick Durbin is stopping his police reform bill moving forward. Yet this is the same Tim Scott who lied on Democrats when he shut down negotiations over the George Floyd Justice Act. We'll talk about that. We'll also uh, talk about how Governor Ron DeSantis, he is specifically trying to get rid of diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of Florida's colleges and universities. We told y'all it was not just about critical race theory, folks. And Bethune-Cookman has suspended one of the football players who spoke out against what was happening in the program. We'll tell you about that as well. And uh, speaking of that, we'll be in Daytona Beach on Friday, Hope Fellowship Church for our uh, community town hall, dealing with the issues at Bethune-Cookman. Uh, doors open at five o'clock. We'll be live from six to eight. We want to see you there. We certainly invite all students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the community there uh, for that town hall. It's taking place Friday. We'll be live in Daytona Beach, Florida, this Friday for the Bethune-Cookman Community Town Hall. Also, folks, uh, don't forget, uh, download our Black Start Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Join our Brina Fun Fan Club. Send your chicken money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. They'll at bookstores everywhere. Of course, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You can download a copy on Audible. We'll be right back. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, present, and future. African genius is, is, is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. This is Judge Matt. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy Mac Wiles, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. As I said, folks, Senator Tim Scott is whining and complaining that Democrats are not moving forward with his 2020 bill. Uh, it is called the Just and Unifying Solutions to Invigorate Communities Everywhere Act. I don't even know what the hell that name is. Uh, and so, um, and so he is. Uh, he said that it would end the use of police chokeholds and create a duty for officers to intervene when they see a colleague using excessive force. And he is openly calling out. Uh, the leader of the Senate Judiciary Committee, 
uh, Democrat Senator Dick Durbin saying that he is blocking it. But I, I, I recall, Randy, that the same Senator Tim Scott shut down the George Floyd Justice Act negotiations. They passed the House, negotiating in the Senate, uh, because he claimed that Democrats wanted to have provisions in the bill that would defund the police. Now, the reason Tim Scott is full of it is because a year earlier in Tim Scott's bill, he actually said that if cities did not pass certain laws, they could not qualify for the federal funding. I got the receipts. I have text messaged Tim Scott four or five times. He never responded to that. So he's really crying wolf right now. I, I, I honestly don't know what else to say, but yes, he's crying wolf. He's, he's saying one thing and doing another. He has never been uh, for real police reform, never, even when it comes down to looking at the George Floyd Act, he's gone against that. There's nothing that has shown that he cares about reforming police policing and, if anything, supports the way it is today. So I don't understand what this later, latest trick is. He's just talking. And, and that's really it there, Michael. I mean, look, uh, he has no credibility with me on this. Uh, you had a number of police unions who were on board um, with um, the George Floyd Justice Act. And he, 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 tried, he used this letter from the head of the sheriff's organization in South Carolina, who was opposed to it as the reason why he stopped negotiating. And it was like, dude, come on. And so I, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to hear the whining of Tim Scott about Senator Dick Durbin when, in fact, it was Senator Tim Scott who chose to scuttle the George Floyd negotiations. And, you know, certainly moreover, he um, obviously he's playing politics. You know, he's thinking about running for president and he wants to be able to go into urban or certainly of color neighborhoods, um, whether it's Latino or African-American neighborhoods, and be able to say, hey, look, I tried to move this bill forward. They blocked it. They wouldn't let me get a get a vote on it or even a hearing. Um, but then, then on the other hand, he you know plays wants to play to the MAGA crowd. So he's you know he's obviously playing his uh, his political game. But you know it's one of those things where when Tim, if assuming he runs for president, I have no idea whether he will or not. Um, you know everybody's running after this MAGA crowd, which is interesting to me because it's it used to be when when Trump was I guess if he was ever at a peak. You know, it was what, maybe, you know, in the high 30s. Now it's in the high 20s and, and dwindling even more. So I don't know why everyone's running um, to this racist MAGA group um, to figure out that that's the way, that's the ticket to get to be president, um, at least nominee in the Republican Party. So, you know, he's playing politics. He's going to continue to play it. But it's certainly interesting if he's a campaigning, if he's going to say uh, the George uh, the George, uh, the George Act, because he changed the name. Why didn't he just say this is? I'm just using uh, the old title. So I find that interesting. He's going to continue to play politics, and uh, you know, we'll obviously see what happens with that. Uh, look, he, he, he absolutely is trying to run for president in 2024, uh, and he wants to act as if uh, he is moving forward on this. But the reality is, his bill was weak. And Democrats wanted more in the bill. The, the House version, the George Floyd Justice Act, was much stronger than his bill, uh, to be frank. And so it's not, it's, and he wants to act like, oh, it's all about chokeholds and uh, the next cop standing by. Dude, stop it. Mustafa, it's, it goes way beyond that, but he wants to offer this minimal bill to act as if somehow he's doing something significant to confront. Uh, police brutality in America. Yeah. I mean, his his bill was watered down at best. Tim Scott knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, the other panelists have already sort of highlighted that. You know, Tim Scott reminds me so much of Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, who I don't even say his name anymore, but he's the only African-American male who's there who never says anything. Tim Scott also, if you follow Tim Scott, and when all these other senators are standing up and talking about important issues, Tim Scott is often very, very silent. Now, he did speak a few times about this particular issue. Here's the other part of the equation that you got to point out. It, it goes back to what we talked about before. 
you know, qualified immunity is important, and it has to be a part of any serious police reforming bill. And if you're not willing to fully embrace that, then you are just feeding folks a, a bunch of foolishness. So Tim Scott knows what time it is, and, and he just refuses to do what's necessary and what's right. And, and there's no way that he's going to get folks to vote for him if he's considering running for president or being part of vice president or one day leading the Senate. People are not going to take you serious because in no time did you ever stand up and do what's necessary. Uh, you know, in times, what, what did Dr. King say? Something about, you know, being willing to stand up in, in tough times uh, and do what's right. So we all know who Tim Scott is and, and uh, we don't have high expectations for him. Um, I, I just, again, listening to him and, and here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, first of all, let, let's play this piece of video of Tim Scott whining, and, and I'm explaining to y'all again what he did and how he won't answer to what he also did. Go ahead. Yesterday on ABC's This Week, Senator Durbin asked Senator Booker and I to come back to the table and start talking about policing in America. I never left the table, Mr. President, but it was... Senator Durbin, who filibustered my Justice Act. It was Senator Durbin who called the effort to make de-escalation training more available a token piece of legislation. It was indeed the senator from Illinois who said, as aspects of my Justice Act, talked about the importance of the duty to intervene, a token piece of legislation. In that legislation, Mr. President, we had more resources for more training because we want only the best wearing the badge in every location, in every municipality, in every county, in every state, in this great nation. But politics too often gets in the way of doing what every American knows is common sense. And here we find ourselves again, Mr. President, having the same conversation with no action having happened so far. Now, Mr. President, I don't speak on this floor very often, but this is my 10th speech on policing in America in eight years. The 10th time I've asked for something that will make our officers better and safer and make our communities better and safer. Another time I have asked for more re Forgive me if I take a nap while he's talking. He's sitting here, y'all. This is the 10th time I've been on the floor. So let me take y'all back to what happened. Senator Tim, Senator Tim Scott went on Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan, and said that Democrats, it was a bridge too far because Democrats were trying to defund the police. Well, a year earlier, Michael Harriet wrote a piece about Senator Tim Scott's bill. He quoted the deputy chief of staff for Senator Tim Scott in the bill stating that the incentive, the incentive to get them to do the right thing was to withhold federal funding if they don't pass bills or laws to make changes. I, so Senator Tim Scott was sitting here texting me and telling me the language in the bill, y'all, and telling me, read, read it, it's right there, telling me where to look, telling me where to go, and all that stuff. This was, here we go, give me one second. I'm gonna show y'all exactly when it was. This was September 28, 2021. 
I got receipts. He go, he says, read sections 113, 114, 202, 204, 363, 382, and more. It's pretty clear. He says, um, read it for yourself. Tell me what you think. I can have my team send it to you. Quote, I don't BS. That, that's Senator Tim Scott. Send me an email. I then said, if Dems want to defund the cops by cutting funds, please explain why you previously want to do the same. How can you say it's a bridge too far when what you now say is bad is what your own deputy chief of staff says was needed? Here's what Michael Harriet published today. That was September 30th. Seriously, what's the difference? And what's the difference when the Trump executive order that you supported did the exact same thing? No. Nope. Y'all can see. No response. October 27th. Senator, it's been almost a month since I sent the last text to you asking you to clarify your statement on Face the Nation with what you did last year. I've also sent emails to your staff that have gone unanswered. Can you or your staff answer exactly what I asked last month? No response. January 19th, Senator Tim Scott, it has been two and a half months since I asked you to explain the difference between what you accused Dems of doing on the Floyd bill and what you proposed last year. Why have you and your staff gone silent on your own proposal? What's the difference? No response. May 25th, I have numerous family members on my show now who are at the White House. They are angry because they say you haven't reached out to any of them since the bill fell apart. They say they want to hear from you, both from Jean's sister, Terrence Crutcher's sister, Amir Locke's family. They're not happy. No response. So please tell me, Senator Scott, how in the hell you actually care about this when you didn't even talk to the family members and you won't even answer the question about your own bill. I got the receipts. We'll be right back. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're gonna have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really got to know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Bill Duke. This is Diallo Riddle, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Stay woke. All right, uh, did we not tell y'all that Republicans are attacking anything dealing with race, equity, diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, affirmative action? It is the basis of my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. It wasn't critical race theory. 
I kept warning everybody. So guess what? Today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced he wants to dismantle every statewide diversity, equity, and inclusion program. He also wants to review tenure for professors as well. He continues his culture wars uh, drama. All right, so I ain't going to play all of this. I want to hear this scrub talking the whole time. But listen to what this idiot had to say today in Florida. Simpson, I think you have the dominant view, which I think is is not the right view, but the dominant view is the the uh, use of higher education under this view is to impose ideological conformity, to try to provoke political activism, and that that's what a university should be. Uh, that's not what we believe is appropriate in the state of Florida. Instead, we need our higher education system to focus on promoting academic excellence, the pursuit of truth, and to give students the foundation so that they can think for themselves. Now, if you see the former approach is dominant throughout the country, particularly with respect uh, to academia, you see it manifested in a lot of different ways, but more recently you see it manifested in things like DEI bureaucracies. And this is basically a component of the administration within universities that are imposing a political agenda, sometimes things like critical race theory. Uh, these bureaucracies are hostile to academic freedom, and really they constitute a drain on resources and end up contributing, certainly around the country, to higher costs as these bureaucracies metastasize. You will see, flowing from that, mandatory things like mandatory DEI training, and that is really imposing an agenda on people. You know, we passed legislation last year, the Stop Woke Act, uh, which basically said that, you know, if you're an employee, particularly of like private business, that you have a right to opt out of that. They can't force that on you. They're, that's litigating it. You know, we, this is what happens every time, you know, we um, usually win these on appeal. So, so, so that's going to happen, and, and that's important. They also will do things like require uh, diversity statements is what they call it, but that's basically like making people take a political oath. And in fact, that has been applied across the country so that if a candidate for a position at a university says, you know, my view is to treat everyone the same regardless of the color of their skin, that they get points off for saying that, that you have to embrace things like critical theory, like the idea of implicit bias and all those other things, and, and that's just not, not appropriate. So, so that has been something that has been happening. So what we did earlier this year, right after the inauguration, we... All right, uh, blah, 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 blah. Joining us now is Dodi Joseph, representative there in Florida. Representative Joseph, glad to have you on the show. Uh, what we're dealing with here uh, is a dictator. This is a man who is appealing to white fear he is pushing the race. He is pushing the racial buttons. Uh, he wants to run for president, uh, and so what he that's what he is doing is absolutely uh, targeting white conservative voters, and he is attacking anything that deals with the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, race, you name it. This is the white supremacist, white nationalist agenda that he is leading. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me. And when you think about Governor DeSantis, he is white privilege personified. And all of these attacks that you see him leeching out, whether it's on the education system and employment, anything related to DEI, anything related to race and advancing racial progress, or at least protecting race discrimination, he has taken to attack. Like, really, all of this legislation is white fragility and legislative form. It's the very definition of what we consider structural racism. So, and, and I don't want to give the governor too much credit, because a lot of this stuff, a lot of this foolishness, which we're seeing not just in Florida, but throughout the nation, is the brainchild of this political hack named Christopher Rufo, who happens to be one of the people that he, he, Governor DeSantis, appointed to serve on the new board of this new college that they are dismantling. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, look, Rufo was the one uh, who uh, was attacking critical race theory, and, and he said in one of his tweets, they want to place it under under uh, everything under the banner of critical race theory. They want to attach woke to everything. 
And so, and I kept telling people, don't try to narrow this thing down of the attack on books, the attack on what can be read. They are trying to impose a white nationalist view. They are scared to death of the demographic changes and they want to continue to stoke white fear. And you are absolutely right with that observation. I'll pull out a couple of things that he mentioned in the clip that you shared. He talked about ideological conformity and the dominant approach. And so let me unpackage that. So he went to Yale, I went to Yale. He talked about this being the dominant view. The dominant view is we believe that racism is wrong. <laughs> so what does that mean? If we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. So we see a systematic attack of him to try to make sure that we don't know our history so he can continue to do things. Like when you saw him bus or fly immigrants over to Martha's Vineyard, that is a repeat and a rehash of a racist tactic of reverse freedom rights. Rides, right? But if you don't know that history, you're not going to make those connections. Knowing our history is part of the battle, I would posit that doing something is the other part of the battle and making sure that there are consequences when you, you violate these laws. So that three-pronged approach to fixing it and reaching real equity is what he's attacking, whether he realizes it or not. So doing something about it, that's the part where DEI comes into place. The reason we have DEI is to educate employers or whomever about the systems and processes they have in place that do have the effect of discriminating against people. And I'm telling you this as a civil rights lawyer, as somebody who used to litigate employment discrimination class actions all around the United States, some of which went up to the Supreme Court, that is what that law is based on. But what you have is people like the governor, the, the pharaoh of Florida, and these little political hacks trying to undo all of the progress that we've made throughout the civil rights movement, not just in education, but also in employment. So I'm flagging both of those. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and again, what he's also doing is virtue signaling uh, to these white conservatives in corporate America, uh, look, the, the, the lawsuit going before the Supreme Court uh, dealing with uh, Harvard and Yale admissions, they have been tailoring their lawsuits to the thinking of Justice Alito, Justice Clarence Thomas. They want to get rid of affirmative action in everything, uh, and, and they absolutely want to target corporate America. They are targeting pu uh, publicly traded companies. Uh, that's, what, that's what they're doing. They want to get rid of anything dealing with diversity, and I keep telling people, stop falling for the okie doke. They are, they are trying to go after everything. They are scared to death of 2043. They are trying to hold on to white power as long as they can, and too, and the, too many of these mainstream media outlets don't want to cover this story. Look, I've had black hosts tell me that they're white producers, like literally say, hey, Roland, I'd love to have you on, but my white producers are scared of your book title because I'm calling it what it is. And I say, you know, I talk about them in the book because they're part of the problem. They don't want to deal with what's happening right now. And that's why people aren't getting the full story. You are absolutely right. And I want to put this in the larger context. Whether you're talking about in media, whether you're talking about in government, whether you're talking about in education, we, we the people of the United States, need to fight for our freedoms, right? The, the, the founding fathers and observers of our delicate American democracy said we have a democracy if we can keep it. These people are not focused on democracy. They're not focused on justice. They're not focused on anything good. They're all about division. They're all about um, going back in time rather than progressing forward. So when he talks about ideological conformity being the dominant approach, what that tells you is he felt some kind of way when he was in school. He felt singled out as the um, however you want to call him kid, right? Because he believed somehow that slavery was a good thing. So when he was teaching history, he was trying to tell people that slavery was a good thing. Well, if you have half a brain, you know that slavery was not a good thing, right? Unless you are a sp you're operating under this white supremacist paradigm, which is devoid of actual reality and centers on things where some people get ahead and some people get left behind. And I want to call 
this entire nation at attention to let you know that we are at a crossroads. We either decide to go back to the days that DeSantis wants to take us to, or we go forward into the promised land that King talked about. You find people like these political hacks trying to use King's words to, to use things like colorblind as and weaponize it to put a cloak around what they're doing to bring us backwards when they're doing these things. Something can be fashionably neutral, but the impact of it is discrimination. And that's what I see with a lot of this legislation. So we need to have all hands on deck in pushing back on this. And he's counting on people being distracted by these culture wars so that they forget that everything that actually matters to people in Florida, whether it's property insurances that are going through the roof, um, putting money on, on, on in your pockets and on your table, making sure you have a living wage, that you can take care of your family with dignity, all of those things, they're doing everything to take that back backwards, and they want to distract you with this stuff so that you don't see what they're doing. It's all the okey-doke. They want to do all this crazy stuff and make sure that they're harming everybody, black, white, purple, it doesn't matter. So I need people to, to remember that the reason he's doing these things is distract you from other stuff that he's letting loose. Today, they let out something about permitless carry. So they just want in a time where gun violence is through the roof, they want to make sure that they can have permitless carry. You, you have no background check in having your gun. This is absurd, but this is what we're dealing with in Florida. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and again, I, I've been warning folks. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, and too often, uh, folks uh, don't really uh, want to understand what's going on here. Representative Joseph, we so appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to go to uh, how much time? We're going to break. All right. I'm going to do this here. I'm going to go to a break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to talk about this here because uh, I've been warning y'all and I've been warning y'all. Trust me. They're going after everything. If you have not read my book, White Fear, you need to be prepared for what is about to happen. And I ain't talking about the next year. I'm talking about the next 50 years. Folks, get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at all these bookstores, uh, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Download the audio version on Audible. We'll be right back. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I got to tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Arnaz J. Black TV does matter, dang it. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Stay woke. December 28th, the Garland, Texas native, 
He's five feet, three inches tall, weighs 200 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. 15 year old, maybe with maybe with a Hispanic male by the name of uh, Julian. Uh, Gianna has multiple medical conditions and needs treatment. Her family is concerned for her well-being. If you have any information about Gianna Griffin, please call the Garland, Texas Police Department at 972-485-4813, 972-485-4813. Go back to our previous topic here. Randy, I want to go to you. Uh, again, it is, it is white America's, white conservative America's attacks uh, on these issues. But but then you got people like uh, Bill Maher, so-called liberal libertarian. You watch his show and his constant whining and complaining about critical race theory, 1619 Project, oh, how the Democrats keep focusing on diversity again. And when I said in my book, I'm like, hey, folks, y'all need to stop acting like this is white conservatives. It's some white liberals, some white progressives who also have white fear, uh, Randy. At the end of the day, most white people want to remain in power. This is a power move. If we are honest about the history of this country, we are 400 years at a minimum behind white people, right? And what we've all been taught is that we can make it, we can overcome if we work hard enough and we get education. But what DeSantis is doing is making it where it's going to be almost impossible for a diverse set of people, anybody that considers themselves a minority, because we're not about to be, it makes it very difficult for us to get the same education, have the same opportunities. It's expensive, as we know, to get an education. So universities have always tried to create equity always try to create opportunities for those who don't have four generations of people who went to college and four generations of wealth to be able to pay for college, to also be able to participate in the learning process and to participate in the American dream. And what DeSantis is saying, I want to cut out that pathway, which would mean that the only people who are going to get educated are the people who have been in, who were have been getting educated historically? What's going to be interesting is that we focus on race. Of course, that is my primary focus. But and and I think DeSantis gets people riled up because of this white fear. He gets them riled up and saying, "Yes, yes, let's just go for it." But they have to understand that diversity programs have helped white women more than anybody else. Okay, diversity programs. When they, when he talks about. Uh, Getting, getting, getting rid of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, that also talks about uh, the LGBTQIA community. That's talking about people that have learning differences. So it's not just people of color. So it'll be interesting if, if people were to pay attention and not act with hatred, because we know that they have no problems voting against us. I believe that, this, that, that it would scare a lot of people. But yet, yeah, this is a whole power play. It's completely a power play. It's interesting to yeah. me that he, yeah. But, but, but the thing, Michael, like uh, said. But, but the thing, Michael, is we've got to make clear to these white women, y'all sitting on y'all asses. The reality is, it's black people. And let me be real clear. And let me be as clear as possible. Ain't nobody fighting harder when, when it comes to DEI, when it comes to multiculturalism, when it comes to affirmative action, than black people. Guess who's way behind us? White women. Guess who's way behind us? Latinos. Guess who's way behind us? LGBTQIA. And so the reality is, black people, we know what this thing looks like. And so the other folks have been riding on our coattails for a long time. They about to, they about to be in for a rude-ass awakening when these contracts start getting uh, uh, snapped up. And it's like, oh my goodness, what happened? Because you're selling your ass. And, and I mean, clearly, Roland, you're absolutely correct. And part of the more fundamental problem is what the perception or definition um, from, and you're right, it's not just the right, but from many Americans, is that um, American history is not made up of African American history, Latino American history, Asian American history. Uh, Native American history, um, except in, uh, you know, a couple pages of a chapter. And when you deny the history of the country, 
it puts, you know, the next whatever generation or the generations after that in a situation where, yeah, I heard about slavery, but I heard some big time rapper said that slavery was a choice and there's nowhere to go to obviously uh, see a different side or the correct factual side. Or will you see uh, the governor of Florida saying, you know what, I don't think we should teach that in an AP class. So that's, that's, there's some fundamental issues um, that cause uh, whether, you know, in education, it's going to make this extremely challenging uh, over the next decades. That's why, you know, this, this makeup of this Supreme Court is, I, I wish we, when I say we, the left, would focus, the, the right focuses so much on the courts. We really did. Barack Obama, for example, didn't even do a good job. He left so many vacancies because yeah. he was looking for a perfect judge. When the right is in the White House, they just want as many young conservative judges as possible. Yeah. They could care yeah. less if they're perfect. And they, a Mustafa. You know, you know, Public Enemy told us in 1990 exactly what was going on, Fear of a Black Planet. Um, so if you listen to that iconic album, it actually speaks about many of the things that we're focusing on today. You know, DeSantis was was talking about a couple of things there. You know, they used to come for our communities when with hoods and robes, and now they come in three-piece suits. So he talked about truth. He's not interested in truth because the truth is making sure the fullness of history is told. He talked about speaking for themselves. So we continue to try and make sure that we're telling our story so the fullness of what has happened, both the tragedies and the triumphs in America, can become a reality. And here's a tool that we should be using, which is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So we had a conversation about education. Title VI covers that. It covers housing. It covers a number of the different things. So we should be pulling our federal funds back from the state of Florida if he continues to go down this path. Uh, look, there are people who are, again, fighting uh, the good fight. Uh, attorneys Fred Gray and Fred Gray Jr. down in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, they are ones who are doing so. Uh, they have uh, secured a great victory there uh, when it comes to the removing of uh, a uh, monument, uh, a Confederate monument there. Uh, of course, uh, you know, in Alabama, uh, they do what they do. Uh, when it comes to uh, these Confederate monuments. So, but let me tell you about uh, what, what they were uh, successful uh, at doing there, folks. Uh, and that is uh, an Alabama judge has ruled that a controversial Confederate monument that's been in the center of a square of Tuskegee for nearly 115 years, uh, it can be cleared to be removed. Uh, Fred Gray Jr. and his brother Stanley, they worked on the case. They join us right now. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, Fred, Fred Jr. and Stanley. And so, again, Alabama has been trying to stop, keep these monuments up in these majority black cities. Uh, of course, uh, Montgomery got fined for taking down a street named after uh, your dad. Uh, but uh, tell us about this case here, how y'all were able to beat uh, these Confederates. Yes, and thank you for having us on. Uh, the strategy <clears throat> was instead of attacking the monument or the Confederate statue. We went purely legal. And what we did is we filed a motion or filed, excuse me, a complaint, which is a complaint asking the judge to quiet the title. In other words, judge declare to us who is the owner of the Tuskegee Square. Because one thing for sure is whomever owns the square itself or the property itself, owns and controls everything that is within that particular area. So back in September uh, 2021, right. we filed an action uh, for declaratory action, meaning declare the rights of the parties. Number two, quiet title. In other words, determine to whom the title belongs. Uh, number three uh, was another uh, cause of action. And then we came back and filed a trespass action against the daughters of the Confederacy. And uh, this was something that really was in the works for several years. But the time was right, and that's when we filed. And um, what's next? Are they trying to appeal? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, at this point, no notice of appeal has been filed. But bear in mind, it's only been a few days. Uh, so that possibility exists. But if that occurs, then we'll be ready to fight that as well. Well, I, I think uh, it's, I mean, it's great. I mean, look, 
uh, Alabama changed the law saying no Confederate monuments can be taken down without, legis mm -hmm. without legislature approval. They put the fine in, in place. Uh, and so Birmingham said, fine. We'll just pay the fine, and people actually contributed money, and so that was that, that was the only recourse there. Uh, are there other monuments that y'all are going after in Alabama? Well, Roland, at this point, this is our main concern. Uh, our main concern is representing the Macon County Commission, and this monument that has towered over African Americans in the city of Tuskegee and Macon County for 114 years. And Roland, this case is really very interesting, I think maybe a little different than the others, because in 1906, you had a county commission, an all-white county commission, that deeded or gave, not deeded, gave property to the Tuskegee chapter of the Daughters of Confederacy. But there was no deed until 1949. 1949, they come up with the deed and said, Okay, we're going to give you this property, but it can only be used as a park for white people, and you have to build a Confederate memorial there. And so it, it was just really interesting um, as we peel back the onion, so to speak, as we found out more and more about this case. And the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> you and I, Roland, can't have property without a deed. I mean, the, the, the daughters have been able to have the downtown city square from 1906. They built the monument in 1909, and that's just how it's been until recently. So we're just excited about the judge's opinion. Boy, uh, that white privilege is something else, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I appreciate it. Great job. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, this right here, uh, Mustafa, is why you got to have your legal warriors on the battlefield in addition to your uh, street warriors. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank have a good evening. Yeah, without a doubt. That's why we got to support our HBCUs that have law schools and black and brown folks are going to law schools at other ones. We got to make sure that we're supporting them because our country, you know, utilizes the law in many of the instances of things that happen in our lives. And the fight continues because we still got over, what, 2,000 Confederate memorials that still exist outside of our country. Um, so we've got to have all hands on deck. And of course, many of the legal folks are going to lead the way, along with activists. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, Randy, about 20 seconds. Go. I just wonder why they want to keep a, doc, a, a monument like that up when Tuskegee is 93 percent black. It seems as if that's why. Of where we've been. That's, you just answered your question. That's why. Right, as a reminder. That's what they want, Michael. They want to keep white supremacy monuments in place to lord over black people. Michael, 15 seconds. All right, very quick. I, you know, the other challenge in the future is going to be you're going to have some people coming into the workplace, into society that are complete race, racism, denial, denialism. And then you're going to have some people coming from different states that were educated on it. And then there's more conflict. And it's going to be the same thing in a cycle because you got some people who have been taught differently than others. Uh, yeah, but especially when you have people like Ron DeSantis who wants to get rid of any uh, issue of race being taught. All right, folks, can we come back? Angelique Miles joined us talking about getting fit, uh, a new you in 2023. Be back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. We'll be back right now. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you what you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. You've been reaching out to us because there are a lot of people who are 45 and 50 over who say, you know what, I really need to get motivated uh, when it comes to, to working out. Some people say, you know what, hey, that's it. I, I, I can't really uh, change things. We've had Donald Richardson Jr. We've had Cheryl Grant, who's trying to become Miss Olympia uh, now that she's 61. Uh, and so I reached out to Angelique Miles. You follow, if you look at her on Instagram, uh, she's often uh, uh, showcasing. Uh, not just how she looked, but also in terms of her workouts and the different things, the different products uh, that she uh, that she uses as well. Angelique, how you doing? Can't hear at all. Can't hear me at all. Okay, Angelique froze. Uh, all right, uh, is she back? No, she's there. Hello. All right, there we go. So, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Glad to have you here. One of the, so one of the things I was looking when I was looking at uh, your your Instagram page, uh, and you talk about being uh, over fifty. You talk about legacy, uh, legacy, legacy. what what keeps you focused, what keeps you uh, motivated, uh, and and so many people. Again, I I get emails from them. We look at the comments in the chat room. They're always talking about okay, uh, you know, you know, where do I start? Where do I begin? Uh, because some just have simply just given up. And, and, and say, you know what, I, I, I can't get that body I used to have, or uh, it's just way too much work. What do you say to that person uh, who is just frustrated um, with that? I say start slow. Start by walking, something as, simply as simple as walking, or something as simple as riding a bike, or just parking farther away from the store to, you know, just get active. It doesn't mean you have to be in the gym five days a week or seven days a week. Just get active, but start. And so, and so when you say when you say get active, um, again, um, somebody hears, huh? Just start walking. And so we've had other people mm -hmm. say, like, yeah, it, it really is that particular process. Uh, yes. Just start walking, but also really begin to consume more water as well, and making that a regular part of uh, your life. That too, but a fitness journey starts in the mind, so that's where you start first. You start by saying, I want this, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take, do what it takes to meet whatever goal that is. So, uh, for, uh, so for you, how long have you been on this fitness journey? Were you always like this, or did you start uh, uh, later in life? I started later in life. I mean, I dabbled when I was younger, but uh, later in life as my body started changing and um, my job changed and just a lot of life changes. I started focusing on it more, but particularly because I was getting older and my body was changing and hormones and things like that. So it just became very important to me. It's a priority for me. And, and so, and, and, and that's the thing right there, because again, a lot of people, they just assume that, Oh, this person, they've been working out since they were in their teens, in their twenties. Uh, but we've had a lot of folks who said, no, they didn't really start until they were late 30s or really early to mid 40s and really exactly. started getting focused on their, on, on their physical self. Yes. 
I mean, it depends on what that is for you. For some people, it's after they have children. For me, it was, um, like I said, my body was changing. I was gaining weight um, unexpectedly. I couldn't eat the same things I was eating. I had to become more active if I wanted to look and feel the way I wanted to. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, questions for our panel. Uh, I guess I'll start with Randy. Randy, uh, did you uh, did you put those Cheetos up? <laughs> I eat Cheetos sometimes. <laughs> I have. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh, uh-huh. Go ahead. <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, Angelic, I have been a fan of yours probably since I've been on Instagram. I followed you very early. And I think your message is so powerful right now, particularly because you found exercising as a way to deal with life-changing, almost like depression, right? Like you had worked up in music publishing and that job um, left. And so you started working out. And I believe one of the things that holds us back now um, trying to work out and get in shape is that there's so much going on around us that it almost seems overwhelming to work out. But working out for you, fitness with you, was a way to help to pull you out of a bad situation or where, where you um, weren't feeling great. Can you um, comment about that? Oh, yes. I was a, a music publishing executive before I'm doing what I'm doing now. And um, it was a very high-profile job. I, I signed people like Missy and Timbaland and... Little Kim, Buster Rhymes, um, part of that job was my identity. So when I lost it, uh, when I lost that career, I kind of didn't know who I was. I was trying to figure that out. And the only thing I could control was getting up and going to the gym every day. Like, I didn't have to depend on uh, a phone call back, an email back from, you know. It, it was the one thing I could control. So that's what I did every day. And it did... I, I, it did help me get out of a deep and dark place. Absolutely. I find your story so inspiring. So thank you for that. Thank you, Randy. And I appreciate you following me all this time. I really do. Michael. Michael, you muted. I am. Keep up the good work. And uh, I appreciate you taking my question. Um, I received a, uh, a tip from someone, when I walk my dog, he has a tendency to smell everything. So mm -hmm. if I want to take him on a nice long walk, the problem is, again, he stops and smells everything, so my heart rate never gets up. So the tip I received was uh, a friend of mine told me to walk down the middle of the street. Uh, that way, the, the smells aren't the same. He can't really uh, you know, stop every 10 seconds. So is that tip accurate? You know what? I don't have a dog, so I would not know that. But I, I think that sounds good. Whatever makes you do it, do it. But um, I don't know about dog smells and stuff like that, so I can't. <laughs> well, Essentially, because I mean, when that, he. That person doesn't when, like that. All oh, right, correct. Because when we're, walking on, when we're walking on the sidewalk, obviously all the grasses are there, and obviously dogs have gone past this place. So he wants to stop and smell. Hence, it makes sense to me. Tip. Why he gave me the tip to walk down the middle of the street where the grasses aren't and bushes and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> makes sense to me. Okay. Mustafa. Uh, yeah, I I'm going to bring it back to humans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned uh, early on that it all begins with the mind. So we know folks make New Year's resolutions. We, we make all these commitments to ourselves. For the folks who work with you or who follow you, what are two or three of the things that really help folks to, to live up to that commitment of, of that it starts in the mind? Um, you just have to make a clear decision to do it. I find that setting a goal helps. For me, I signed up for a 5K race um, at the beginning of my fitness journey because that made me learn how to run. Um, whatever that is for you, but you have to go through with it. You can't just think about it because so many people just watch other people work out and say, I can't do that. You just have to actually do it and don't try to do too much at one time. Like start slowly and don't burn yourself out. 
but it absolutely starts in the mind, but you have to do it. Well, I think that, uh, again, but, but there, there are people out there who are, who is as easier said than done, Angelique. Uh, and, and I think uh, the way to, get, I think the way to get them there, way to get them there is to really say, folks, you're not going to lose, you're not going to lose 30 pounds in the next week. And so if you simply start somewhere, if, if you if you say, you know what, man, I am not sitting there. Look, I can't walk on that treadmill uh, on an elevation of 10. Fine. Walk on the treadmill flat. Just start there. And I think, again, that's one thing when I'm talking to people, I don't care what it is. I'm like, yo, you just got to start somewhere. But you can't just stay status quo right now. Exactly. You can't give up. You can't uh, let yourself go. You can't give up. And um, it could be as simple as don't drink soda. Stop, you know, cut back on soda, cut back on sugary drinks, cut back on white bread and white potatoes. It's a simple, it's little, it's all the little things come together and, uh, and help. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. So for the people out there, uh, who who are so who are so frustrated? Uh, my whole deal is just you know start 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 once and actually sit there and write down if you drink if you, if you drink soda now just start writing down how many how many sodas do you drink per day and then per week and then say all right you can't give it up okay cut back cut back once a day once a week or whatever and then begin mm -hmm. to go from there. Uh, but again, it's, but you have to start somewhere. You can't just keep going on and on. The way the way you have been. If folks want to reach out to you, where do they find you? I didn't hear that last part. I said, if folks want to reach out to you, where do they find you? They find me on on Instagram at Angelique Miles and on TikTok at Angelique Miles Eight. All right, well, Angelique, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, I got folks texting me. They were like, "Okay, Roland, how old is she?" Uh, and if I, I think I was. I, I think you posted what fifty? Was it fifty six? Fifty six. I'll be 57 56. this year. 56, yes. All right, 57 this year. So there you go. So, so I knew I was right there. Well, look, we certainly yeah. appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right, take care. All right, folks, got to go to the We'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Thank you. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hi, I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered, and while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble.
Folks, the family of Atiyah Jefferson, they've suffered another loss. Jefferson's sister, Ann Bacar, uh, died from congestive heart failure. In 2019, Atiana was fatally shot uh, and killed in her home by a Fort Worth police officer, uh, Aaron Dean. Now, of course, Amber attended part of her sister's murder trial last month before being readmitted to the hospital. Uh, Dean was found guilty and sentenced uh, to prison. Uh, since Atiana's death, the family has endured uh, one tragedy after after another, her father, Marquise Jefferson, died two weeks after her funeral, and her mother, Yolanda Carr, who also has had congestive heart failure, uh, died a few weeks later in January 2020. So certainly our condolences uh, to the Jefferson family. Let's go to Colorado, where prosecutors uh, have dropped the charges against uh, a black Army veteran who says three Colorado Springs officers beat him during a traffic stop in October. Dalvin Gatson says officers viciously beat him after he was pulled over on October 9th. Body cam video shows multiple officers punching and kicking Gatson once he was pulled over, which caused damage to his eye and ruptured his eardrum. Gatson was initially charged with two counts of second-degree assault on a police officer, resisting arrest, obstructing a peace officer, driving under the influence, and driving without license plates. Gatson entered a guilty plea for improperly displaying the license plates on his car and paid a $15 fine. All the other charges were dismissed. His attorney, uh, Harry Daniels, released the following statement by dropping the charges. The district attorney has made it clear that these officers had no reason to detain Mr. Mr. Gatson for a DUI investigation, much less beat him mercilessly and then smile for the cameras as he lay on the ground bleeding. In other words, this decision means that their actions weren't just excessive, they were unlawful. Chief Adrian Vasquez says that officers Kobe J. Hickman, Matthew Anderson, and Christopher K. Hummel did nothing wrong. But the reality is that they brutally beat Dalvin Gatson for a $15 fine, and they should be investigated, arrested, and prosecuted. Failing to do so puts lives at risk. Just ask Tyree Nichols' family. A federal lawsuit alleging Colorado Springs officers uh, violated Dalvin's Fourth Amendment rights by using excessive force has been filed. This is what we talk about here, Mustafa. Here you got the police chief said, oh, did nothing wrong? Seriously? You did all of that for what ended up being a $15 fine? You know, they, they continue to dehumanize us. And by dehumanizing us, it allows them in their minds and in many instances, sometimes in the courts, to justify the brutalization that continues to happen to, to black men and women and sometimes brown men and women. So, you know, this is a case where the Department of Justice has to make sure that they're leaning in, doing their own investigation of both the police department that's there, their leadership, uh, and the actions of these police officers. And we have to continue to keep a spotlight on it to make sure that we are pushing to make sure that justice actually happens. I, I just, again, uh, here's a perfect example here, Randy. Uh, this man viciously beaten... And again, traffic stop. Over and over and over again, what is the most consistent thing we see in these police brutality cases? Basic traffic stops. I believe that people are being stopped specifically to be these police officers' punching bags. I think the traffic stop, stop is an afterthought. I don't believe they're even well, it's showing that they're not even stopping them for a reason that for a real valid reason. And so we need to deal with the issue of certain cops going into the profession. I believe what that has some serious issues and some serious hatred against brown and black people. Michael. Yeah, pretty much co-sign on uh, both what Mustafa and Randy just said. It's just, you know, it's, it's sad. It's just, it's, you know, it's not gonna stop. It's just not. Whether you have a body but, cam on, whether the video cameras, we just, until the laws change severely, not Senator Tim Scott's law, but a real, real law that really matters. What, what, How about I, I, walking while black? Uh, that is, a, a cop pulls a black man over. He was being confronted by two cops. Why? His tattoo sleeve. 
when he when the, uh, in Burbank, when he asked the female officer why he was being stopped, the woman said that it was because of the tattoo sleeve on his arm and that people who usually walk in that area are not tattooed like that. The officer then apologized and refused to answer his questions when he complained about her response and reasoning. Brandy, why is she still a cop? That's exactly what I was going to say. Immediately, she needs to be fired. Immediately. We don't need to wait until a woman who has shown that she has clear prejudice and bias hurts somebody. She needs to be gone. But she won't, because we yeah, know we have I, to leave I, the I, Yeah, I, people. I mean, you stop the brother because tattoos. And then right. say, oh, people in this area... Uh, they don't wear tattoos. Roland, 30% of Americans, 30% of Americans have a tattoo. It's not even an unusual thing anymore. So he, we, we know why he was stopped. We know why she harassed him. Yep. It's very clear. Oh, oh, yeah, we know. And, 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 this, and this is the thing, Mustafa, that we, we talk about. If you are the police chief, you should be calling someone in and saying... How in the hell are you stopping somebody over a damn tattoo? Exactly. It goes to leadership. Leadership should be very clear about, one, following the law, following the procedures uh, of that department. So if the department has a procedure that says, we're going to pull over everybody got a tattoo, then pull over, you know, all kinds of different folks, which we know that's not the case. So here's what you do. Uh, and if DeMario was here, he would also share with you, one, make sure you go out and get yourself a good attorney. Uh, and then, two, make sure that you're also safe in that situation because we know how they can escalate. So, again, hit them, hit them in the pockets. If these cities uh, and these departments want to continue to have these types of actions go on, then folks just sue them. Well, I absolutely agree, Michael, with, with, with the idea of suing them. But the problem is when they pull you over for a minor traffic violation that results in a $15 fine, you got your ass whooped. The, the only reason, look, the tattoo could have escalated into something else as well. And that's the problem. We, we simply can't even live black. And when it's something so basic, it, it might escalate into a death. Yeah, until, until, you know, we obviously have been talking about the laws and, and, and the like. Until the laws change in the interim, why not? Why, why can't these police chiefs, and I, I understand the collective bargaining agreements, I get it, but these police chiefs to send a strong deterrent message that I don't care what the police union does, if they sue me, they sue me, me being the police chief or the police department. I'm taking action and removing bad officers from the force. So while the laws are going through the political process, which is obviously going to take a while with this House of Representatives, why not just start canning bad police officers? And then maybe other people will see it as a deterrent and be like, well, I don't want to get fired. Yeah, we got to go through the whole lawsuit process, but in the meantime, I don't have a job. So maybe that's one of the tactics, because she clearly needs to be relieved of duty. Well, look, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. Uh, but the bottom line is we see what happens. Uh, let me do this through out of Kentucky here, folks. A former Louisville, Kentucky police officer uh, pled guilty to federal charges of using excessive force, but is not going to spend any time in jail. Katie Cruz admitted to shooting a protester with a pepper ball while standing on private property, not posing a threat to Cruz or others. She pleaded guilty to one misdemeanor count of using unreasonable force during her plea uh, hearing. Cruz was sentenced to two years of probation, 200 hours of community service, and a $5,000 fine. She is no longer an officer with the Louisville Metro Police Department and has forfeited her Kentucky law enforcement certification. This is, was attack on protesters there. Thank goodness uh, she's no longer on the police force. Uh, but again, this is what folks have to deal with uh, all the time uh, in this country, Randy. I was thinking, as we wait for these laws to change, you know, we talk about the arc of justice and how slow it can be. I really do appreciate shows, what you're doing, Roland, and what I see people every day doing. We have to take 
some of, we have to take this in our own hands, as, as I think that we have, and highlight when these stories happen. You don't see these stories on mainstream America. You, you know, it's very rare that we hear about this misuse of force, this abuse of force. And so when we are out and we see things happening, I just really appreciate that people are recording it. And, and you see people on these social media platforms letting the public know. So at least there's some public shame and some public pressure. And Roland, by you showing these incidents on your show, it definitely makes put some pressure on these police forces. And so until we can get some official laws changed, I believe that we should continue to, to highlight and call out the bad apples. Well, look, we, we, we got to keep pressing this. We got to keep pushing this uh, because this happens over and over and over again all across this country, folks. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. Well, yeah, these cops, because they got a badge and a gun, they figure they can stop you for any reason whatsoever, and you have to comply. Michael, Randy, Mustafa, we certainly appreciate you joining us on today's show, being on the panel. Thank you so very much. Folks, uh, tomorrow we'll talk about Bethune Cookman. Why have they suspended one of the outspoken football players? Hmm. We're going to break it down tomorrow. And don't forget, we're in Daytona Beach on Friday for our community uh, town hall dealing with Bethune Cookman University and their issues taking place at Hope Fellowship Church. Doors open at 5 p.m. We're live 6 to 8 p.m. Everyone is welcome, open to the public. Let's pack the joint out uh, and let's make this thing happen. All right, folks, don't forget, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV. Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV, and get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at bookstores everywhere, Amazon, as well as download on Audible as well. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow back in D.C. Holla! Folks, black is this. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black. Support this man, black media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of black America, Roller. Hey, black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network, every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network.